stand and worship this morning. Through every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance, well, I believe that you are my fortress, that you are my portion, that you are my hiding place. Well, I believe that you are the way, the truth, the life. Well, I believe that you are the way, the truth. The life will I believe through every blessing, through every promise, through every breath I take. Will I believe that you are provider, that you are protector, that you are the one I love? Will I believe that you are the one? The truth, the life, when I believe you are the way, the truth, the life, when I believe you are. It's a new horizon. I'm set on you. When you meet me in a day with mercies that I knew, and all my fears and doubts, well, they can all come true because they can't stay long when I am here with you. Well, it's a new horizon, and I'm set on you. When you meet me in a day with mercies that I knew, and all fears and doubts well they can all come true because they can't stay long when I believe you are the way the truth the life well I believe you are the way the truth come to because they can't stay long when I believe you are the way the truth the life when I believe you are the way the truth the life Take a moment and let's greet each other, the Lord, this morning. Amen. You guys believe that this morning? Thank you guys so much for being here. We are super excited that. You guys came and took a, took a little time out of your um, Sunday morning to come and worship um, with Fall City. Thank you for everybody out on Facebook and YouTube land. Um, there's just a, an amazing message of that uh, God is going to um, bring this morning to the church through the music and through, uh, through Tim, uh, Tim's message. So we thank you for taking a little time out this morning to, uh, to uh, be involved in that. And we hope that it blesses you this morning. Um, there's a lot of things going on in the church. Make sure you guys are checking out the uh, um, 
Facebook page. We went down uh, this past Thursday again to the tap room and had some fun and played some songs and uh, and uh, played some worship. It's something kind of cool when people are out dancing um, to like Christian songs. It's kind of cool. Um, maybe they maybe they know it, maybe they don't. But God is like working in in a really cool way. Um, just kind of just kind of keep a keep an eye out for um, some additional things going on and. Um, We've been able to uh, do a lot of things in the community um, since the inception of the church um, with uh, the tithes and offerings that God's laid on um, each of our hearts. So we take time each week to give back a portion um, to God, as he instructed us to do, um, to, uh, to be able to give back to um, this church, but also this community and um, those that are in it. So it's, it's our jobs to, uh, to be good stewards of, of the uh, tithes and offerings and to also honor God in that way, in the way that he um, instructed us to do. So um, as we sing this next song, let's continue to worship and uh, worship him with our tithes and offerings. Sing to him. Well, I count on one thing, the same God that never fails will not fail me now you won't fail me now it's in the waiting the same god who's never late is working all things out you're working all things out oh yes i will lift you up in the lowest valley and yes i will bless your name Oh, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy for all my days. Oh, yes, I will. I count on one thing. Well, I count on one thing. The same God that never fails will not fail me now you won't fail me now in the waiting but the same god who's never late is working all things out you're working all things out oh yes i will lift you up in the lowest valley and yes i will bless your name back in the house of the Lord, to be able to sing praises and worship to him, to be able to offer him ourselves, our talents, our voices to him, 
to the one that gave it all, to the one that went to a cross and suffered and bled and died, poured out his blood on the cross, his body beaten and battered, as prophesied long ago. All this had to take place so that we could be reconciled back to our Father God through his Son, Jesus Christ. Each week we take time to remember that sacrifice as Jesus instructed us to do before he left the earth. In the same way he met with, with his disciples the night before he was betrayed, the night before he went to the cross to celebrate a Passover meal. The Jewish tradition that had taken place years and years and years and years in advance. But this night it meant something more. It's true meaning. That the Lamb of God, his blood would be slain and poured out for us Jesus took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body. It's going to be given to you. Take and eat. Then he took the cup and said, this is my blood. It's going to be poured out for many. We, the many, sit here today and honor him in this memory, in this moment, remembering the sacrifice that he gave for us conquered death and defeated the grave by rising again on the third day. So as we sing this next song, this is your time to, uh, to honor him with the emblems. Feel free to partake at your own time and pace. Feel free to stand or sing, sit down, however you need to do it. This is your time with your Savior. God, we just thank you so much for this moment, for this time that we have, the freedoms that we have, not just in this country, but the freedoms that we have in you, Christ, through your death, through your burial, and your resurrection. The things that we once hold dear, we count as loss, because there's nothing more precious than you. And the gift that you give us, the gift of life, a gift of the Holy Spirit, a gift of your love. We just lift you up this moment with communion, with song. And we thank you so much for showing up in a mighty way this morning. We give you all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. In your son's name, Jesus, that I pray. fountain I drink from always my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide. The ransom for my life always my song. You are good. You are good. my sins
the king of my heart. Be the fire inside my veins, the echo of my days. Oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails, the anchor in the waves. Oh, he is my song. And let the king Inside my veins, the echo of my days. Oh, he is my song. You are good, good. Oh, you are good, good. Oh, you are good, good. Oh, you are good. there you're always present you're always there ready to come running to us with your arms open wide you've never let us down you've never failed us you offer strength and support when our faith fails feet fall. Thank you so much for believing in us, for sending your son Jesus, for loving me, for seeing past my insecurities, for seeing past who I am, to who I can be in your son Christ Jesus. Thank you so much for his gift. Thank you so much for the king. You're so good. Pray that you be with him as he brings your message this morning. It's in your son's name, Jesus, that I pray. Amen. You guys can have a seat. All right. So my question is, if you're not on the ground, bouncing up and down, Jonah Bump style worshiping? Are you really worshiping? I mean, honestly, honestly. He's bouncing around. He's happy. 
He doesn't have the worries of the world on his shoulders, right? He, he's at an age where he doesn't have to fight with mom and dad to get dressed or take a shower before he comes to church. Man, that's the life, isn't it? So, um, glad you guys are here. We are on Sermon 3 of a series called Slain Giants. And we all have uh, both uh, giants that are pretty... Um, pretty visible in our lives, and then we've also got some of those under-the-radar things that we wrestle with that um, nobody knows about, and we hope nobody ever knows about, right? And those things are um, maybe some of the toughest things, and, and they may not even be quite considered sin or sinful, but the thing about it is, is what it breeds inside of us kind of leads to that, right? Our insecurities lead to things uh, that maybe we shouldn't do, and our inconsistencies lead to things that maybe we shouldn't uh, do. And these are typically giants that tower over top of us, that cast a shadow on our lives when we should be walking in the light of Christ, right? Um, and today, uh, there, there is... Um, my iPad is doing something really weird right now. I think it's possessed... It's getting ready for our Halloween series, I think. Um, but today, uh, one of the things that uh, I wanted to talk about is that these giants, especially in our culture, tend uh, to be a result of normality or perceived normality, right? And short-sightedness. And so last week we talked about self-doubt and insecurity as giants to be slayed. But this week I want to dive a little deeper and kind of get to the cause of those, uh, which I think... Um, some of the causes of self, uh, self-doubt and insecurity is what we call normality or the comfort trap or safety or stability or whatever it is that's kind of become uh, an idol, right? Uh, what is the, the canvas that we throw ourselves up against um, in contrast to make us feel like we do? Like how many of you guys feel... Um, like you're better than everybody. Oh, wow. All of you? Wow. Fall City is a bunch of jerks. No, I'm just kidding. Nobody raised their hand. How many of you guys feel like you, like, like everybody else, like, catches the break? Anybody? Anybody ever feel like everybody else catches the break? I know a guy like that. His name is Tim. He's really good looking when I see him in the mirror, but I, I seem, it seems like everybody else kind of catches the break. And I believe um, that canvas that we throw ourselves up against is what we call normality, right? It's that comparison against everybody, against everybody else kind of in the, the middle class or in uh, the Midwest or everybody else who has, you know, the three-bedroom, two-bath house, couple pets, two-and-a-half kids. Um, you know, a lease or a, a car payment and the white picket fence, right? And they have to mow their lawn in straight lines so it looks pretty. And we compare ourselves up against that. We, we compare ourselves as, well, I don't compare myself as a mother and a wife against uh, June Cleaver, but, um, but we, we may do that. We compare ourselves to other people. And so we allow normal, whatever that is, right? To kind of uh, beat us into submission. And this comes from being short-sighted, simply thinking about the now without any thought of the future. Uh, This isn't the same as being in the moment, because I think being in the moment is important. But how many of us are investing not in who we are, but who we are becoming, right? Because who you are may be good, but we've always got a next step to take. But some of us are so uh, beat down by normal, that we don't have a chance to even think about what our next step is in who we are becoming. Or some of us can't even think about it anymore. We're too busy. We're too bogged down. I mean, let's think about this. We wake up in the morning. We get the kids ready for school. We get them to school. We go to work. Then we pick up the kids. We get homework done. We go to practice or a game, right? We go home, uh, baths, brush our teeth, go to bed, 
and then start all over again. That's normal, right? That's normal. Now, within that normal, there could be some really extraordinary things as long as we are purposeful about what our normal is, right? As long as we're purposeful about what our ordinary is. I mean, honestly, who has time to dream? Who has time to pray audacious prayers? Who has time to slay giants? You see, this is the Goliath of normality staring you down and taunting you, saying, oh, well, this is good enough. This is what everybody else is doing. Maybe you're a half a step ahead of everybody else, or maybe you're a half a step behind everybody else. But as long as it's just a half a step, then you can just keep doing what you're doing thoughtlessly, without any purpose, without any goals, without any, without any foresight, right? This was David's response to those taunts from, from his Goliath which was actually the literal Goliath. Um, 1 Samuel chapter 17, we've read these verses before, but as I kind of dissect this story, I, I keep finding new things, more and more things. And it says, Today the Lord will conquer you, and I will kill you and cut off your head, which I still think is one of the coolest verses in the Bible. And, and then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people. But not with sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle. And he will give you to us. As Goliath moved closer to attack, what happened? Very good. We have one person that's able to read, so let me read this to the rest of you. <laughs> David quickly ran out to meet him. So the giant is running toward him, and while everybody else is running away, where's David running? Toward his giant, right? He's running towards him. And, and, and he didn't let Goliath taunt him, because he knew who he was becoming. Who was he becoming? The king of the greatest nation in the world. He was becoming the king of God's people. He was becoming the king of Israel, right? He knew that he was extraordinary because of who God was. All right? He wasn't ordinary. He was extraordinary, right? He wasn't extra ordinary. No. He was better than ordinary. He was extraordinary. It wasn't uh, so much that David was awesome, but it was an awesome God who chose to work through him. Right? Because let's face it, God could have chose anybody to work through him. God could have chose uh, any of David's brothers. He could have redeemed Saul in this moment. He could have picked the tiniest, little scrawniest runt out of the army. And he could have defeated Goliath with, with whoever he wanted. But he chose David because David was willing. And David didn't only, not only knew who he was and who he was becoming, but he knew who he belonged to. Right? And this story, and I think especially this part of the story, gives you permission to be extraordinary. Right? Not to be normal. Not even to be comfortable, for that matter. But to be extraordinary. So the big question is, what, what was the ordinary in this situation? As we unpack 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 16 and 23 through 24, like what did the ordinary look like? Well, the ordinary in this story was a bunch of soldiers running in fear from their giant. Right? Running in fear from their giant. Heck, they even had the promise of greatness dangled in front of them, and they still would not face their giants. Do you know what the reward was, was for, for beating Goliath? You get to marry the king's daughter, one of the king's daughters, and like this would be, I'd be like, bring it on, Goliath. You and your family never have to pay taxes again. Like, I'm down with that. Like, that would be, that's extra money in my pocket, right? You don't have to pay taxes. Not to mention the fact you're going to be a hero, right? But the fact of the matter is that the normal of the day was fear. It, it, the fear was so strong that not even the reward that the king offered 
was good enough for people to risk their life. But the fact that the matter um, of the normal of today, or of that day, was the fear of what? The fear of being conquered, right? The fear of losing, the fear of being the laughing stock, the guy who's going to step out against the nine-foot giant that has armor that weighs as much as them, fear of failure, fear of dying, fear of never being able to see their family again. Those are legit fears, but they were so powerful that it paralyzed them. And so no one tried. No one attempted. No one stepped up. And an entire nation just sat in the status quo of a futureless circumstance. As a matter of fact, it says uh, for 40 days already, Goliath had been coming out each day, a couple times a day, to call these guys out and taunt them. And each time, they would just, they would just drop their heads and kick rocks back to the camp. Sit down and complain about the status quo. I guess this is all, right? Until someone, until someone who knew who he was becoming showed up in an ordinary fashion to do an extraordinary thing. Right? Showed up in in his everyday situation. He's a shepherd boy and his dad hollers for him and he says, your brothers are down the battle lines. I need you to take him, I need you to take them some cheese and some bread. Just in an ordinary fashion, in his everyday situation, running errands for his dad, he shows up in this ordinary fashion and does something extraordinary, which is slay a giant that everybody else was afraid of. And, and really, at this point, nobody else could, would, or was willing to fight. The thing is, that story is not so different from our reality here, right? Right? How many of us wrestle uh, with living in fear? It could, be, it could be fear of anything. You want, you want to see a helicopter parent, you're looking at him, all right? I'm scared to death of something happening to my kids. As, as a man who has buried a child, the, I don't know if I could deal with that anymore. And so there are aspects of my parenting and aspects of, of even my discipline where I overcorrect and I coddle, maybe just a little too much. I hate the fact that maybe I'm creating snowflakes because snowflakes annoy the crap out of me, right? But that's, I live in fear. Um, our idol, especially in America, in first world countries, our idols are our comfort and stability, right? And so we work for what? The steady paycheck, even if it's something that we hate to do. Even if we can't stand the job, stability is the end-all, be-all. And so we never push for who we're becoming. We just kind of settle into that office chair or into that assembly line or into whatever it is to become whatever it is we are. We can't really say what it is anymore because we're not even sure. We're just doing what we've been told to do. And so we were subscribe to, to what the world has deemed normal, Right? And we allow the, the world to define what normal is for us. And we just subscribe to that. But n- normality, it's kind of relative, right? What's your normal? What does, a, what does a fight look like in your household? Do you reckon that's normal to every family? I don't know. Do we have any wall punchers here? <laughs> Do we got any shoe throwers here? Do we got any kids that, um, that were the recipients of wooden spoons when they were, w- whenever they were children? We got anybody? Yeah. You want to know what really hurts is a, is a Hot Wheel track. That sucker will leave a whelp on the back of your leg. And if you're running, on the bottom of your foot, too. <laughs> My mom was little, but she could swing a Hot Wheel track. She could. That, that's not normal. I don't know. That doesn't sound normal to me. Being disciplined with a Hot Wheel track or a wooden spoon. One time she got me with a moccasin. I didn't even know we were Indians. Seriously. She spanked me with a moccasin. Anybody else in here been spanked with a moccasin? I know, right? Because that's not normal. Because normal 
is relative. There were a lot of crazy things that I thought was normal that as I grew up and became a parent, I knew wasn't normal. Because normal is kind of a relative thing. And so like the Israelite army, we see the challenges walk up and taunt us. And what do we do? We just run back to camp. We run back to making ends meet. We run back to, uh, to the job that we took in order to set us up and set a foundation for us to accomplish our dreams. But in the process, we forgot what the dream was and we stopped chasing it. Right? So we just run back to camp. But we forget that we, like David, were called to be extraordinary. We were called to be extraordinary. Sanctified is kind of the biblical word. It means set apart, right? We're set apart to be extraordinary. Not ordinary, not normal, but extraordinary. Not because of who we are, but because of the awesome God that we belong to, that is willing to work through those who are willing to allow Him to work through them. As a matter of fact, Jesus says this in John chapter 14. He says, If you love me, obey my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and He will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive Him because it is so normal can't receive Him. Because they don't recognize Him. But you know Him because He lives with you now and later will be in you. He's talking to his disciples here, and he says, the world doesn't recognize this dude. But he's what's going he's to shift you from ordinary into extraordinary. He is the Holy Spirit. The same Spirit that, raised, that raises Jesus from the dead is the Spirit that lives in, on, around, and through us. That's not ordinary. That's extraordinary, right? We are gifted with the Holy Spirit to to dwell inside of us, especially to be extraordinary. When David is anointed the future king of Israel, whenever, whenever they go through all seven brothers and none of them's good enough, and Samuel comes, do you know what happens when he anoints David? David drops down on his knees and he pours oil over his head. He anoints him with oil. In the Old Testament, that was the representation of what? I'll give you a hint. It rhymes with Holy Spirit. Yes, Holy Spirit. Somebody got it. Since you guys couldn't read earlier, I figured I'd cheat for you. (laughs) But um, it was the representation of the Holy Spirit. And so whenever God calls somebody and sets them apart, makes them extraordinary, and has something for them to do, guess what he does? He anoints them with his Holy Spirit, just like he has us as his, his, as his sons and daughters. He has anointed us, called us, petitioned us with his Holy Spirit, right? And so David knew that he was extraordinary, not because of his skill, not because of his stature, but because of the Spirit of of God, which would one day slay the giants of sin and death and hell that was dwelling inside of him. As a believer, guess what you have? The Spirit of God that slayed the giants of sin and death and hell, and he is dwelling inside of you. He is fueling your life. What happens when an engine doesn't receive fuel, when the fuel pump goes out? I know because I changed one for the first time in my life. It always fails after you, have, after you fill your gas tank up. So when you drop your gas tank, you have to drop a full tank of gas, right? When the engine doesn't get fuel, it doesn't go anywhere. It sits in the garage sits in the driveway. Now, the garage is comfortable, right? It's all covered. Some of them are heated. Some of them are are man cave-esque. Some people, not me, keep their garages clean and organized. Mine has um, skateboards and scooters and bikes and, and 
tools that I'll probably never use laying around in there. It's got a deep freeze um, with meat that's way too old to even eat, but I've never cleaned it out, you know, one of those situations. Um, a garage is comfortable for a car to set, so if you want to be normal, if you want to just sit there, that's great. But we have been given this fuel to live a supercharged life, to be extraordinary. And all we have to do is flip that switch and know who we belong to and allow that, that spirit to fuel our lives and slay our giants, right? Normality is a myth. It's relative, right? Especially when you're a believer. Normality is not an option when you are a true believer. The second thing I want you to know is that extraordinary, it's a journey, not an event. It's not a one-time thing, okay? It's something that keeps on and keeps on and keeps on. As a matter of fact, in 1 Samuel 18, kind of after this whole David and Goliath thing, it says this, whatever Saul asked David to do, David did it successfully. So Saul made him the commander over the men of war, an appointment that was welcomed by the people and Saul's officers alike. When the victorious Israel army was uh, returning home after David had killed the Philistine, women from all the towns of Israel came out to meet King Saul. They sang and danced for joys with tambourines and cymbals. That sounds like a pretty good life. Dang. Like you fight, you beat up a giant, and then all of a sudden all the ladies come out and they're singing and dancing, playing music for you? David knew what was up, didn't he? But this was their song, all right? Saul has killed his thousands, and David his ten thousands. I'd say they probably sing it better than that, but um, I'm a drummer. So uh, this made Saul very angry. What's this, he said? They credit David with Ten thousands? And me only with thousands? Next, they'll be making him their king. Wink, wink. Um, so uh, from that time, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. You remember back whenever we first started this series, Haters Gonna Hate? Yeah, that just solidifies that. You see, David didn't stop at Goliath. That was just the beginning. There was a lot more to do. There was a lot more to handle. There was a lot more on, on the future of David's plate here. Maybe that's the thing about being extraordinary that people don't like, right? It creates more and more opportunity to be extraordinary. In a sense, it kind of creates more work. So if I really push at this and I actually accomplish it, now all of a sudden I have more work than I ever had. And then normal is not an option anymore. I have to keep going and keep going and keep being extraordinary and keep being extraordinary and, and, and keep accepting these calls on my life that God has given me. There's going to be more and more and more giants to slay. And so David defeats Goliath, which causes him to be the commander, which causes him to fight even more. There were probably days at war when he's like, I would love to be chilling under a shade tree, just watching my sheep frolic and keeping an eye in the distance for some sort of wolf or animal or something to try and kill him. Then what I do, I, I, I grab it by the jaw and beat it to death, and then I go back under my shade tree and I get to chill a little bit, right? That was normal for him. But now there's no such thing as normal. He kept going and kept going, which was just the beginning of the, the journey for David, he spends the next several years being extraordinary. It doesn't look extraordinary, but he's being extraordinary. Hiding in caves and living in the wilderness. Because Saul is so jealous that he's trying to kill him. He's got armies chasing him through the wilderness, into caves, to try and take his life because he's so jealous of him. But as he's doing this, the Holy Spirit is preparing him to be the king of Israel. He even strategically conquers cities that would be a problem in the future of Israel's reign. And so even while he's in, a, in an ordinary, maybe subordinary situation, he's doing extraordinary things. Because he knew who God told him he was. And he lived his life according to that. Like, if that's his story... 
right? If that's his story, before the indwelling gift of the Holy Spirit, before the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus, what should your story look like? What does it look like to be extraordinary for you in your current position, in the job that you have, in the family that you have, in the town that you live in, in the area of town that you live in, in the things that you do, in the things that you are, in the teams that you coach, whatever it is, what does that look like? Because Ephesians 2.10 says this, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. So we can what? So we can do the good things He planned for us long ago. So he can do the good things that he planned for us long ago. So he can do the good things that he called you to whenever you became his. These things that maybe nobody else could do. In this situation, David was the man to conquer the giant that was, that was putting the future of Israel at risk. And there are situations in your life, guess what? You're the man or woman. You're the one, the only one who could get it done. But you have this, this choice to make because, because some of you have a specific calling on your life. We all have a general calling. That's simply to glorify God. But how we do that is specific in nature. Some of you have a passion. Some of you have a gift. Uh, some of you have something that you should be journeying in and toward that you're not. That you won't. That you have allowed normality to rip from your hands. But you've allowed that giant to taunt it out of you. Out of your mind. Out of your life. And God created you on purpose. With a purpose. For a purpose. And there's a giant that everyone else is afraid to take on. That only you have been built to conquer. And this makes you extraordinary. It does. It makes you extraordinary. But are you gonna are you gonna run toward the giant to fight him? Or are you gonna fall back into normality and run back to the camp with the with, with the rest of the normal people and allow fear to rule your life? Allow fear to rule the people who are in your sphere of influence. What is it that you're going to do? What is it that you've been called to do? And, and, and for some of you, you may not know. You may not be there. For some of you, I'm willing to say, you know. And you began that journey, and something happened, or a circumstance came into your life that overshadowed that, and now all of a sudden you have a hard time finding it again. But here it is. You were created on purpose, with a purpose, and for a purpose. And because the gift of the indwelling Holy Spirit, you're extraordinary. And that is a giant that has been taunting you, and has been throwing things at you, has been, has been telling you that you are not capable to accomplish what it is you've always wanted to accomplish. But God has already ordained you. He has, he has already He has already commissioned you to slay that giant. You see, normal has a way of keeping you from slaying your giants because comfort is nice. Don't get me wrong. Comfort is nice. I love my bed. It's called an eye comfort. It's memory foam. You sink into it. You wiggle. You get real warm. I have two pillows. One is a, is a feather pillow and it wraps up around my ears and the other one is just a regular pillow that I put over my face. And I get comfortable. And I sleep for hours. Sometimes I nap for hours in the middle of the day. Why? Because I love comfort. I love it. I love comfort. But guess what I'm not doing whenever I'm napping? I'm not being progressive. I'm not getting crap done. 
I'm just napping. I'm just worried about my comfort. And I say, these are things that I'll get to whenever I'm done with my nap, right? Well, guess what, y'all? We're done with our nap. We're done with our nap. It's time to get uncomfortable, to recapture those passions and that calling on your life, and it's time to slay the giants of normality and short-sightedness. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for this day, and I thank you for the fact that you have called us your masterpiece and that you have built us specifically to conquer the giants that only we can conquer. For our sake, for your glory, for the sake of the ones around us and our sphere of influence, I pray that you just amp up your spirit in this room right now and give us the confidence that we need to go out and recapture the passions that you hardwired us to chase down and help us to chase those down and help us to grab them by the jaw and beat them to death lord we love you we thank you for jesus who died buried and resurrected and gifted us your indwelling spirit so we could do so it's in jesus name i pray amen Hey, guys, real quick, there is a Volleyball League sign-up sheet uh, on the desk in there. Make sure you sign up. If you're awesome, sign up. If you're terrible, sign up, okay, because we need a little bit of both. We need uh, awesome people to really play, and we need terrible people to make fun of because that's part of community, right? Sarcasm is our love language. Let's make sure uh, we do that. Uh, don't forget about youth group on Wednesday nights. Uh, fourth through eighth grade ish ish there's going to be food there's going to be games uh, I think every time there's been a mess to be made so sounds fun make sure you bring your children to that and make sure that if that's like in your wheelhouse you volunteer for that we could always use the help right all right have a great week we'll see you guys later